nine universities, all alike in dignity. In fair grass, where we lay our scene. From single parts form a new unity. Where busy brains make busy minds serene. Distinguished guests. Fellow members of the Arcus community. Good morning and welcome to the Arcus Annual Conference 2023 at the University of Graz. This is Gerald Lind. I am Johanna Stadenbauer. The two of us are in Arcus to support early stage researchers pre and post doc studies. And as you may have noticed, we like to borrow from Shakespeare now and then. Today and tomorrow, our job is to guide you through those parts of the conference where all of us are together. So let's begin without further ado with the opening session. The first speaker of this opening session represents your host university. Please welcome the rector of the University of Graz, Peter Riedler. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, Ladies and gentlemen, very warm welcome dear friends, to our university, to the University of Graz. We're happy to see the full aula here in, in the morning, even though we had a, a reception yesterday where many of you, or almost all, I think, uh, took, took already part. And I suppose that some of you also had the chance to explore the city a little bit. Even though it's lacking students in Easter time, of course, Graz um, is um, a, student, a student town uh, with about um, 50,000 students. We have a very close uh, cooperation with um, uh, the University of Technology, the University of um, Art and Music and the Medical University, which used to be part of our university until 2004, I think. And um, well, that makes uh, Graz a uh, university well, town, makes, uh, and um, Graz, uh, I hope you have the chance to to to, um, uh, to explore it um, to a little bit today, and, and, and maybe also not even uh, tomorrow. It's a great honor for us that um, the uh, annual conference, the third altogether, and the first and the second phase of ACUS takes place in Graz. We are as a university very much committed to ACUS and and, and, and uh, uh, cooperation. We are very happy that uh, we have uh, found us um, uh, now nine universities. Uh, welcome again to Maynooth University, a uh, new, new partner. Um, and um, what brings us together? Uh, I, I looked a little bit, um, I had a look at all the documents, of course, for the conference, but um, especially also on the mission statement and on, on our values. And, uh, I think it's, it's uh, worth reading it from wild to wild, um, especially when we talked about in the, the pre-workshops yesterday um, about the future of, of ARCUS and what's our goal, how can we make our cooperation sustainable, um, uh, even possibly without um, the EU framework and, 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 and financing, even though that's of course an important part, it's a EU, a EU initiative, but the, 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 the key issue is of course what what makes um, uh, ACUS valuable for us, for the students, for scientists, for the nine universities. But first of all, why, why did we find together? Um, because um, uh, we are committed to transform European higher education, research and innovation through deep cooperation and progressive integration in pursuit of an equitable and sustainable future um, by together a forward was looking open, integrated, and research-driven European university, building transformative excellence with and in for all. And um, we, uh, we, commit, we are committed uh, to educating critically and society, uh, socially engaged European citizens, equipped for lifelong learning, leaving no one behind, generating excellent, open, challenge-driven, innovative, and reflective knowledge. Acting as a committed multi-level societal Acting and global player, player, bringing down barriers to effective cooperation. It sounds very normal for us, and that's a good thing that it sounds very normal for us, because it's based on on the European values of democracy, the rule of law, respect for diversity and human rights, solidarity and the pursuit of peace and justice in Europe and the world. And um, 
today's, uh, and, um, uh, today's uh, meeting and, and the session, uh, the session after the opening session, is uh, committed um, uh, human rights, and that's a good thing because um, it's so to say the basis for the cooperation so we are having. But and that's an important thing. I think uh, we had very good meetings yesterday, also in the, in the Rector's Council, and we'll have the, the chance um, um, to, to, to uh, continue our, our negotiations. Of course, ARCUS has to live by and with concrete projects. Uh, we have to see the, the, the benefit on the daily basis of our work at the university. Um, uh, the benefits for students, and 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 our our scientists, and, 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 and um, I think we have to keep on uh, to develop uh, uh, joint study programs to bring together in the defined um, uh, research fields um, uh, our our scientists. That's not an easy task, but I think we have to have to work on that um, uh, to make a step forward to make ARCUS uh, sustainable and to to make um, our our employees and um, I don't exactly remember the numbers but it's an impressive number of, of scientists of students we are bringing together the nine universities um, uh, the European universities as a total we heard yesterday um, uh, are the home base uh, for 50 percent of all PhD students in Europe so it's an enormous number of, of, of people engaged having the same goals but we have to bring it down to concrete projects and um, that's our task today and tomorrow. Thank you for your engagement. Thank you for the preparating work um, in our local team, in, in ACUS, uh, in Granada. And um, thank you, all of you uh, who already worked yesterday on the work uh, and packages and, and, and um, uh, continue the work today and tomorrow. Um, I representing the University of Graz and would say our university believes in ACU, we are strongly committed and I'm sure it's also the case uh, for all the other eight universities who keep on working for a good future of ACUS and the European universities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Rector Riedler. Thank you very much, uh, Rector Riedler. The city of Graz is not only your current place of residence, the municipality of Graz residence. also supports ARCUS and this conference with funding the guides for the city walks on Wednesday afternoon. We are happy to welcome as the representative of the city of Graz, Municipal Councillor Christian kutzina Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank first, uh, morning, thank everybody. you to the organizers of this first conference to and uh, to the University of Graz for hosting this uh, event. Uh, on behalf of Major LKK and Vice Major Judith Schwentner, I welcome you to the city of Graz as well. Uh, maybe one question who has been to Graz before? Okay, so several of you. Because tomorrow in the afternoon, you saw there is a cultural program for all of us. For all of you who haven't taken the chance, uh, you can do that tomorrow. And all the others, maybe you will have some new experiences about the city. So that's a good uh, chance to get to know Graz better. Um, but we're also interested in the topics of the conference. It's a city. Uh, we like this network. Uh, there are nine um, universities all around Europe now together. And we can learn from each other. We can learn from other universities. We can learn from other cities. And um, my engagement is especially in the field of climate change, of mitigation, of mobility. And I think there are lots of solutions needed. And there are lots of good ideas um, all around uh, Europe and in different cities. So uh, we are looking forward to also get the experiences from you. Um, the other thing is that the focus um, of this university or of this uh, conference is on human rights, and conference. this is also a very important topic for the city of Graz. So, uh, Graz declared in 2001 already as a city 
for or city of human rights and we do a lot to support this idea so it's a good uh, way to have this uh, topic here well that's what i wanted to say have a nice time here enjoy graz enjoy the conference uh, thank you once again Thank you very much, Councillor Kosinovoit. So, our last speaker has already been with the Arcos Alliance as rector of the University of Graz. We are very delighted that he found time for Arcos also in his current office. So, we will watch now a video message from the Austrian Federal Minister of Education, Science and Research, Martin Polaschek. I am particularly pleased to welcome you to the ARCUS annual conference via video message. As you all know, I was rector of the University of Graz before I became minister. Esteemed guests, dear friends, I am particularly pleased to welcome you to the ARCUS annual conference via video message. As you all know, I was rector of the University of Graz before I became minister. The University of Graz was one of the very first Austrian universities participating in the European Universities Initiative. And I was thus involved in this initiative from the very beginning. I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate the Alliance on the high quality of the project. I am deeply impressed by the results of the Alliance so far. The HEI involved in the European University Initiative are key contributors to strengthening the internationalization of entire institutions as well as of the Austrian and the European higher education landscape and the European research area. What makes the ARCUS Alliance so special? The ARCUS Twinning Initiative is a best practice example. It aims to strengthen professional cooperation between teachers and students and to create opportunities for joint learning and teaching activities. The groups travel to subject-related institutes at the partner universities. The cooperation of experts from different countries in the Alliance who work together on the development and implementation of innovative projects in teaching, research and innovation and involve the economy and society leads to synergetic effects. ARCUS has a strong focus on supporting PhD students and postdocs, early stage researchers, both in terms of academic careers and careers outside academia. ARCUS has also facilitated intensive networking of researchers who have participated in various activities. What particularly innovative and creative plans does ARCUS have for the next few years? ARCUS II aims at establishing an open, inclusive and research-oriented joint university of the future. In my point of view, the Alliance's projects are ambitious as they focus on climate change and sustainable development. 
artificial intelligence and digital transformation and European heritage and identity. A main focal point of the Alliance is the implementation of joint strategies and initiatives as a building block on the way to a common European campus and joint mobility programs. I wish Arcus Alliance much success. The University of Graz and its Alliance partners further fruitful cooperation and a successful European exchange. We thank Minister Polacek very much for sending this video message that went on almost without a hitch. The upcoming hour will be devoted, dedicated to the topic promoting human rights in ARCUS. Your host for this panel is Patricia Matusch, Vice Rector for Projects and International Relations of the University of Wroclaw. They didn't tell me. <laughs> okay, anyway, so uh, once again, um, very good morning. Uh, this is my pleasure and honor to welcome you on the panel on human rights. We are happy to welcome today three distinguished speakers. First, Professor Milosława Antonowicz. Uh, please take your seats. Professor Antonovich represents the Mohila Academy from Kiev. Um, as far as you know, we welcomed Mohila Academy as the as associated partner of Al Arcus Alliance, so we are very happy and pleased to welcome Professor Antonovich here. Uh, she is the head of the Center of Genocide and Human Rights Studies at the Mohila Academy, very experienced in the, uh, in the area of human rights studies as the professor of law. So we very happy to have you with us. Um, I would like to welcome also Sjur Bergan, uh, the head of, uh, uh, of the Council of Europe Education Department. Um, <laughs> involved in diverse projects or intercultural dialogue, uh, education, and an expert in the field, so we have a practical experience as well. And last but not least, uh, Dr. Lisa Heschel uh, from the University of Graz, um, the head of European Training and Research Center on Human Rights and Democracy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, before we start the first question, I'm going to join our panelists down there. Thank you. Before I make another mistake. Um, I would like to, before we start with the question and I give you the floor for um, introductory remarks, I would like to say that um, the last uh, year has changed our approach to human rights and also uh, change our way of thinking about uh, human rights protection uh, in Europe. Uh, the 24th uh, February last year has impacted all of us and all our universities in the Arcus Alliance as well. Uh, as the Alliance we made a statement uh, to support our Ukrainian colleagues in different, um, in, in diverse uh, higher um, education institutions. Uh, it was uh, our voice to say no for the uh, Russian Federation um, aggression to Ukraine. But also uh, the last year has, um, 
has impacted our way of thinking on something which I call in my research uh, grassroots humanitarianism. So the huge support of the um, European Union citizens, uh, citizens to, the, uh, to our friends and neighbors uh, in Ukraine. So we are in a very particular moment in, uh, in the history uh, of Europe, that's sure. Um, let us stay with a very short, please, very short introductory um, remarks on the human rights in the European alliances and particularly uh, in ARCOS. Um, let's start with Professor Antonovic. Thank you. Thank you. I was actually <laughs> invited uh, to prepare a short presentation on, on <laughs> very, very short. I, really, I promised that it would not be long. But um, so I would like to start with the words that it's my great honor and pleasure to be here at this conference. And I thank you, thank my thank you to the organizers of the conference who invited me to talk about international human rights education in my University of Kyiv Mohyla Academy. So the National University of Kyiv Mohyla Academy of Ukraine joined the ARCUS Alliance, as it was already mentioned, as an associate in September 2022. And by the way, my center <coughs> for Genocide and Human Rights Studies uh, has received such invitation to become, a, um, to become an associate partner even before. Uh, so we are very thankful that already within a week after the beginning of the full-scale Russian aggression against Ukraine a year ago, uh, Arcos universities have taken active measures to support the citizens of Ukraine and especially its academic communities. As it was already mentioned by Patricia, Arcus also endorsed the statement published by 41 European universities alliances calling for the restoration of peace, democracy, and respect of human rights in my country. And I think that even the fact that um, Arcus University Alliance invited me to talk today at this uh, conference is also a gesture of support to Ukraine. In my short presentation, I would concentrate on education in the field of human rights. However, I cannot but start with reminding that human rights are not just words for Ukrainians nowadays. Sorry, I would be emotional in this part, but I can't, cannot stop being emotional. So, uh, human rights are not just words nowadays for Ukraine. Those are universal values which our warriors, our militaries, our volunteers, our doctors, uh, human rights activists are defending against Russian aggressor for nine years already. And uh, since, February, since February 2014, actually, however, the full-scale aggression started a year ago. And every day of Russian invasion causes grave human rights violations in our country, great sufferings to millions of civilians, millions of people were to leave Ukraine and uh, were to displace within Ukraine. Tens of thousands of Ukrainian children were abducted already, and you know that arrest, international arrest warrant was issued against um, Vladimir Putin and Russian children on Botswan, Maria Lvova Belova. If to return to our history, Ukraine has old democratic traditions since Kiev and Rus state and later Halichvalin Princedom. Kiev Mohila Academy, where I teach, was founded in 1615 as Kiev Brotherhood School and later Kiev Mohila Academy. Famous philosophers like Skovoroda taught courses based on ideas of freedom, humanism, and enlightenment. Our tradition of human rights in Kiev Mohila goes back to those times. For a couple of centuries, when Ukraine was occupied by the Russian Federation, later by the Soviet Union, um, Kiev Mohila Academy was closed as the university. After the revival of Kiev Mohila Academy in 1992 and opening law school within it in 1995, we naturally started to teach human rights in our law school with possibility 
from students of other schools of our university to take human rights courses. Uh, first, I developed the course of human rights in the Constitution of Ukraine and later the course of international human rights. As a chair of international law department, I had an idea to develop and um, teach courses in different aspects of international human rights and curriculum of Kiev Mohila Academy allowed it as we have liberal arts education since uh, revival of, of Kiev Mohila Academy. In 2010, we established the Center for International Human Rights within the Department of International Law and uh, of the Law School of Kiev Mohila Academy, which was my academic fellowship project and the main aims of the center was education in the sphere of human rights, research in different aspects of human rights, developing and coordinating activities on human rights protection and monitoring human rights in Ukraine, expertise of legislative initiatives in human rights. Among the main activities of the center, there was also developing and introducing the certificate program, undergraduate level program, on international human rights, which was launched in 2011 and became open for enrollment, not only to the students of Kiev Mohela Academy Law School, but other schools as well. The curriculum of the program included required courses of public international law and international human rights and elective courses. Courses included into the curriculum of, this, of the certificate program were developed by our professors and lecturers who had graduated not only from a university in Ukraine, from a Ukrainian university, university, but also had a master or PhD degree from a Western university in Europe, USA or Canada. Uh, so, um, academic fellowship program, which I have already mentioned, allowed our professors and young lecturers to be participants and to develop their, their own projects in this field. The certificate program has, successfully <clears throat> has been successfully running since 2012. The curriculum extended as new courses were developed, such as international protection of gender and children's rights, human rights and biomedicine, international protection of national minorities' rights, controlling human rights bodies, and others. The name of the certificate program was changed into public international law and human rights, and new elective courses such as international humanitarian law, international criminal law were added. Ever, every year since establishing the center and this certificate program, we had between 25 to 45 graduates of this program. Uh, B bachelor students of law school and other schools, uh, such, such other specializations, such as po political science, uh, in, in ecology, and others. At the master level, our Center for International Human Rights also developed and opened the certificate program on relevant or topical issues, issues of public international law, and in its curriculum, there are elective courses of practical aspects of applying to the European Court of Human Rights, genocide studies, topical issues of international humanitarian law, international health law, transitional justice, and others. Ten years of running our certificate programs proved that it was a good idea to give students specialization in the field of international human rights. Our graduates are now working in the European Court of Human Rights, in United Nations bodies, in human rights NGOs such as La Strada, Global Rights, and others, in Ukrainian human rights protection system, in courts, and so on. We invite international professors, to te international, uh, professors and uh, practitioners to, in human rights to teach in our program, certificate program. So, um, Center for International Human Rights was involved in different projects, like AFP, which I have already mentioned, like the project Academic Cooperation between the Center for International Human Rights and Raoul Wallenberg Institute for Human Rights of Lund University on academic exchange. Uh, the um, very interesting 
project concerned teaching courses on international human rights with the University of Tartu, uh, financed by the Estonian Ministry for Foreign Affairs and others. Opening English language LLM program in international law and human right, rights was and, remain, was and remains our goal. Thus far, we have only one master program in law in our law school. However, we do have um, teaching potential for opening English language LLM program in international human rights. So uh, I very much look forward to potential partners of our LLM, potential LLM program, and I have great hopes for this conference to find such partners. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm sorry if I... Thank, thank you very much. Uh, it, was a very, it was a very fast presentation. Uh, we give the floor to Sir, please. Thank you. There is a button works. Okay. Thank you very much. And first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to come to Graz. Not only because it's a great university city, it's a, a city of human rights, but also because it's the seat of the Council of Europe's uh, European Center for Modern Languages. And of course, without language, you cannot think about human rights, you cannot articulate human rights, you cannot speak about human rights. So I think that takes me to my first point, which is universities can do quite a bit through their study programs and curricula. Make human rights a mandatory part of any law program, any political science program, and any program in a related discipline. <clears throat> but don't stop there. Offer an introduction to human rights as an elective course for anybody. I and mean, it's one of the, I think, the wonders of the CTS system and the higher education reforms that we've been doing in Europe, that we now have a, an option to take credits that are not directly related to our major. Um, I'm not saying make it mandatory, because I think if you add up everything that people would want to make mandatory, um, you probably will be very hard put to take a bachelor's degree with 240 ECTS credits. Um, <clears throat> that's my second point would be what you do with the culture of the institution. Um, and I would say, use the Council of Europe's reference framework of competences for democratic culture. Actually, it says democratic culture. It doesn't say um, a culture of human rights. The reason is that when we thought about it, we could have ended up with a very long title emphasizing democracy, human rights, intercultural dialogue, as that. But we found these are all subsumed into the concept of democracy. You cannot have democracy if you don't have human rights. You cannot fully enjoy human rights except in a democracy. You need to develop, and the new universities do this, a culture, institutional culture, which we call a whole institution approach, where the way you interact, the way students and staff interact are marked by respect, are marked by tolerance, are marked by comprehension. Uh, you live, not, you don't only teach human rights, you live them. You can't, human rights is not something you can teach two hours a week and forget about the rest of the time. Um, you support student associations who, with the human rights program. And the third point, I think, is these are institutional policies for campus, if you want, for the institution. But they're also institutional policies that reach broader to the surrounding society. I don't think that the ivory tower was ever a very good image for the university. If it had been an accurate image, universities would not have survived for eight or nine centuries. But that's the image sometimes we have. We know that in our surrounding societies, there are quite, cha quite some challenges. Um, I live in a country now, France, which has a strong populist right and a strong populist left, which is perhaps a unique constellation in Europe, but it's often very much on the right. We need, as academics, to engage in public debate, to talk about the importance of uh, human rights, but also to demonstrate how human rights and democracy can actually be done in practice. It's really, of course, you can think of it as institutions, you can think of it as texts, 
but it is very much a culture and a way of behaving. Part of that would also be that we receive as institutions um, scholars and students at risk, and that we do what you're doing now as university networks. We put it on our agendas, we talk about it, and then we put it into practice. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Herzog. So yeah, also thank you from my side for inviting us. We are the European Training and Research Center for Human Rights and Democracy, and we were actually the first human rights center established at an, uni uh, at an Austrian university in 2009. As part, and I think this establishment of our competence center at the university is an expression of this importance that universities become really like human rights actors themselves. The self-understanding, what you have mentioned already, like this um, not only support researchers and the teaching of human rights, uh, but to understand themselves as human rights actors alongside other actors such as the state, um, NGOs, international organization, or for example, human rights cities. So also to reach out um, to, to other actors at the local sphere. And um, I also think that it is so important, this both dimension, this positive dimension to provide resources to encourage teaching and research in human rights by supporting initiatives, but also this negative dimension to that universities themselves live the culture of human rights, that they in their internal policies, in their external policies, assess their administration in terms of human rights, kind of a human rights based approach to, uh, to, to university administration, that this is one of the big, or this is one of the potential this network has as well, to encourage a culture of human rights within the higher education sector. And um, what you also mentioned is this, um, the negative dimension that, that university become a safe space, a safe space for the expression of human rights, uh, a safe space for those who are in need of protection, like displaced scholars, scholars at risks, but also for protest, you know, this, there is a lot of, we have a lot of talk about cancel culture at universities. So that universities also stand up for their scientists, stand up for the freedom of expression, stand up for science, because is that what we are as well? We are institutions creating knowledge, creating the foundation of, 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 of science. And um, in, this, in this sense, I, I consider this Arcus network really to, to use the strength, to use the potential of the individual um, institution to combine forces, also to foster this um, culture of human rights within the European higher education area. Thank you very much. Um, you touched upon uh, many important points, like uh, including human rights to teaching and research is something that is already done in our universities. Uh, but um, I would like to ask the question and go probably a little bit beyond, beyond uh, the research and teaching. Uh, how can we as um, um, Arcus Alliance uh, include human rights in the big space uh, uh, in our uh, alliance, going beyond teaching and research. You said about the culture, including human rights to our everyday way of thinking and, and uh, leading our universities, but what can we add more? That's the first question. And um, I'm sorry, let's start with Dr. Heschel this time. Uh, another way uh, Yeah, thank you. Um, I think this, uh, how can ARCUS contribute I mean, to it? It's, it's this culture of human rights at each and every university um, has different levels. 
Um, so when we talk about the internal level, that really all administrative policies, all whatever is planned, working programs, have this human rights component, so that you really start from which implications will an activity have on human rights. So kind of a human rights assessment. Um, it can be done through the establishment of human rights commissions, like really evaluating, like assessing how which at the internal level, how our policies, how our activities will have positive effects, spillover effects uh, to, the, to the greater public. When it comes to the external dimension, like for example in, in, in cooperation with other entities, um, it might be an, a valuable approach to actually say, okay, also in this external dimension we include human rights clauses, for example, in how we want to have our corporations shaped. Do we want to, in order to avoid, for example, that we cooperate uh, with entities that implement um, maybe discriminatory or segregationist um, hiring policies? So really to have this commitment at all um, different levels also to include, um, of course, like the code of conduct at the internal level, like how um, this self-commitment, when we're talking about human rights obligations for private entities, or even if they are public universities, it's not about legal obligations, so we are very much stuck to the self-obligations. How will funds be dedicated? What um, mechanisms are in place to, um, to ensure that the rights of students, of academics, are actually protected by university, internal university um, regulations, complaint mechanisms, so that you really have these possibilities to address human rights violations. And I think by combining these measures, and the ACUS network can of course support this, take up these ideas, can encourage um, its partner universities to really say, okay, this is what we want. We want to embrace this culture of human rights. We want to, of course, dedicate resources um, to human rights specific topics. Uh, by doing so, you can really create, I guess, this, um, this momentum for protecting human rights. We all know that what has been mentioned in the opening speeches, climate change, artificial intelligence issues, digitalization, this cannot be tackled individually. This cannot be tackled at the national level. So we need really this um, kind of movement, this kind of uh, cooperation at the internal, uh, international level to join forces, so to say, and to use the potential by focusing on, on, on both, like um, as you mentioned, going beyond this um, research and teaching, um, but really establish codes and mechanism how to implement human rights in the daily lives of ACUS partners. Thank you. Of course, being a retired, recently retired policymaker means that you're in the wonderful position of being able to talk about what others should do, so <laughs> I'll take the opportunity. Um, but I, I'd like to follow up um, what Lisa said. Um, I think underneath it all is really the message that developing a culture of democracy and human rights as an institution is ultimately a leadership issue. The leadership has to make it clear that this is an institutional priority and it has to make it an institutional priority. And I think a, a, a network like Arcos can take that one step further by making it a joint leadership issue. So it's not just University A, but it's University A, B, C, D, and in this case, going up to nine. Um, and that's important. I think we've seen a shift in Europe. Um, the Council of Europe has a long-standing cooperation on the democratic mission of higher education. With, uh, it started out with US partners, now we have the International Association of Universities on board, and also the Organization of American States. In the early days, some 25 years ago, there was a quite neat divide, and that from the US, you had the university presidents and some deans. From European universities, you have activists. 
but they didn't necessarily have an institutional responsibility. We're seeing that shift now. So more and more of our European participants are rectors or deans. So that's a very good, very good, good development. Um, what can you do as the Arcus Alliance in practical terms? Well, you can adopt a student, you can adopt a, a scholar. Um, I think it's wonderful that we have a representative of Ukraine. Um, we can go one step further and maybe set, I'm sure many universities do this individually, but wouldn't it be great to have an Arcus scholar from Ukraine, an Arcus student from Ukraine as a measure of the solid, practical solidarity shown by the Alliance? So, uh, as far as we are uh, new, associate partner of our course, <coughs> my university is. Uh, so I, I cannot say much about what our course can do. But I can say, <coughs> I can share my views upon what we can do <laughs> for our uh, We have an unlucky experience of, of uh, defending, not only protecting human rights, but defending human rights. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, so our students, our professors are literally defending human rights. So I think that uh, it would be a good idea to, uh, to have the next conference in our university where, where our professors and our students can share the experience of how European values, human rights, should be defended when it comes to that. Unfortunately, sometimes it comes to that. So, uh, that would be my uh, invitation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it would be um, an honor for us to, to meet and, um, and share experiences. Um, Lisa mentioned the scholars at risk, uh, a category which become um, even more important uh, nowadays. So I would like to ask you about how can we protect the scholar, scholars at least? How can we promote um, the, the protection, but also how can we promote the freedom uh, at uh, universities? So, sure, let's start with, with you this time. at identifying scholars at risk. But also, <coughs> um, by offering a place on your campuses for scholars that you may know, um, and now with uh, you know, an associate member from Ukraine, um, I'm sure that uh, in the immediate term it would be relatively, unfortunately, relatively easy to identify um, such uh, scholars. But I would like to follow up also with the point that maybe Lisa mentioned, uh, making human rights and democracy a part of your cooperation strategy. I say not in the sense that you don't cooperate with anybody who's not the perfect Democrat, because in this case, I think the circle of cooperation partners would be relatively small. But when you have students on campus from countries and institutions that are not characterized by their respect for human rights, expose them. Expose them to democratic practice. Expose them to human rights practice. Um, because I think you know, the, this kind of exposure very often can leave its mark and the so uh, you know, grains that can flourish later on. Uh, many countries actually have a, a strategy of um, keeping up with alumni who may reach important positions in their home country, and they often do this for uh, reasons of foreign trade. Well, why not also do use the same logic, but apply it to democracy in the world? Thank you. Lisa. Yeah, um, to provide a safe space for scholars at risk, um, I think um, especially um, 
the after the the beginning of the Russian war, um, universities actually showed a great flexibility and they proved to be very welcoming. However, what um, I think could be uh, an asset in this ACUS network that we actually learn from each other is how to respond to situations of mass displacement. Because we saw a lot of ad hoc measures, we saw a lot of uh, willingness, um, however the structural approaches are still lacking that we really say when you say the identification of scholars at risk but really what are the best ways how to integrate them into academic life because it's not just about like the in, in the very short term it's about really providing them with security but when it comes to academic freedom it also means that they should become an integral part for the time staying that they become an integral part of university life. And I think there, universities can learn from each other. You have to see the best practices. How did University A respond to that? And what can we learn from it? And um, this is in within such a network. <coughs> and you also mentioned the possibility of a scholarship. You know, this, is, this, this, this means and possibilities could be used with the, of this network and really to collect best practices, to exchange. Maybe a partner university might be better suited to provide the environment for one displaced um, uh, colleague to really have structures in place, institutional policies in place, how you can also cooperate in this field of, 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 of mass displacement. And um, I think universities really should uh, have a great stand there and I mean as you mentioned there was immediately after the war there was this um, there was this response that there is um, this commitment to protect and provide um, scholars with uh, displaced scholars with protection and, and, and a safe haven um, and I think this is really their universities also should use their their position in society to really draw attention to the problems um, displaced students face, um, but also on the on the fact that many students are still remaining in Ukraine, how to support them in continuing the studies because maybe they can't leave the country, how to ensure that university uh, university courses can actually continue in Ukraine, how can we fill teaching gaps like really this a structural identification and also a focus like now in this immediate, like, like in Ukraine, um, like in these immediate cases, how can we as a network truly respond um, to these um, challenges the higher education system in Ukraine is facing? And I think there is a lot of potential in ACWUS, in the network, among universities um, to, to really jointly uh, develop strategy for support. Before I give the floor to Miroslava, just a short comment because uh, there are two ways for sure uh, to support Ukrainian researchers and academics. One is of course uh, the invitation to our universities to exchange for their mobilities and for the shorter or longer stays. But um, during uh, my numerous meetings with Ukrainian colleagues in the last months, um, I realized that they also wanted us to help them there, where they fight for their universities to stay in, in full operation, uh, to support them in teaching process. So they are at least uh, two ways, and we shouldn't forget that not everyone wants to leave. There are people waiting, uh, fighting for their universities and, and trying to keep them operating, which is also important. Uh, so. Miroslava, just add what we can do and uh, what do you need for us. Thank you very much. You are doing already. And for the especially is doing much, very much. So, uh, real unfortunately, Ukrainian scholars are at risk. Uh, when it was far from us, when other scholars were at risk, yes, of course we didn't understand it that much as we understand now. So, uh, what, what is meant scholar at risk from one point of view? Uh, 
uh, say from my department, international and European law department of the law school of my university, out of eight professors, only two are physically in PU. I am internally displaced, and I displaced because we have a grandchild, and uh, the, his kindergarten was closed in PU, so we, uh, we went to Western Ukraine. Um, other young professors all left Ukraine because they also have kids and they have to, guard, to take care of their safety. So they are in different universities uh, of Europe and of Canada and of the US. Um, and this is, of course, a, a great support. Uh, however, uh, our university has now campuses in Toronto University, in Gisson University, in Vilnius University, which means that uh, students from our university who uh, go there and they study there, however, uh, it is considered the campus of Fiu Mohela Academy. So they take courses and have credits. They may take courses of uh, the, the, the schools where they are. Um, however, they are considered to be to within our curriculum. Uh, so uh, this is a great support, but, uh, but I understand for your position uh, how you can help. We have many guest lecturers, by the way, and professors write us from different universities and um, offer their support so that they can teach or have uh, the guest lectures. Say, next week I would have a guest lecturer from New Zealand, and, and this is, of course, invaluable in experience for my students in genocide studies course to hear about uh, genocide, say, in Australia, or, um, which we, of course, know very little about. So this is one of the opportunities to have guest lectures. Of course, we have online education. Uh, only first year students uh, study offline. Uh, other students of other years have online education, which uh, gives us a broad possibility of involving uh, professors from different countries these days. Uh, different programs could be joint programs, and this is uh, one of my aims here, to be here. I am looking for a partner in a joint, or we may think about the way this LLM program in international human rights can be. So I would like to talk to many of you about such a possibility. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and probably um, last question, uh, but before I ask this, I would say that as Arcus Alliance, um, we also got a, a grant from the Polish National uh, Acad um, Academic Exchange, and we are organizing two summer schools where the Ukrainian students and uh, students of all our universities would uh, work together um, and um, exchange also ideas. So it, it's a good uh, starting point for, for co co cooperation. Last question, uh, maybe a tricky one, uh, but I would like to ask you about the big uh, or the biggest challenges in human rights um, in the years to come. Uh, so maybe we go a little bit to the future and what is, in your opinion, the biggest challenge that, that we are going to change in the area of human rights and human rights protection? Um, Miroslava, this is now from <laughs> Apart from criminal law, apart from crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, crime of aggression, uh, certainly after our victory, we would have a huge, to do a huge, huge job in the sphere of human rights. I mean that uh, we still have to conduct our judicial reform. This is number one reform. Uh, and uh, to protect uh, human rights to fair trial. Uh, the uh, core, the one of the main rights uh, which should be protected in a democratic state. Uh, so I think all rights, uh, the, the right to property, it has been violated in relation to millions, tens of millions in Ukraine. So that would be also a very, very important work to protect the right to property, the, the right to freedom and security of person, 
to all possible rights. I can enumerate now the European, the European Convention of Human Rights, and all of these rights should be given huge attention uh, after already nowadays, of course. Our life continues, and as far as you, you see me here, <laughs> so uh, our life go, or goes on, and our rights might be violated. Not only crimes might be committed, but rights might be violated. So all rights should be given very serious attention uh, in Ukraine as well as in other states. No doubt. Thank you. Um, well, very briefly, I think that, that the big challenge is to stop what we've come to refer to as the backsliding of democracy. Um, of course, Ukraine is a very particular situation that's hope for the particular situation that we saw soon. So I think in, in many of our societies, we see situations where attitudes have developed in the wrong direction. We're skeptical of foreigners, we're skeptical of uh, the possibilities of individuals to influence the development and we see more and more people actually questioning the relevance of academic knowledge and understanding. If that's not the challenge for higher education, I'm not quite sure what to do. Um, and of course, it's very easy to say what the challenge is. It's quite difficult to actually say what we should do about it. But universities need to engage in public space. They need to demonstrate why academic knowledge and understanding is important why societal decisions need to be based on that. And I think uh, it was Lisa who mentioned also this exchange of your practice. I think this is a wonderful form for that. Show her some examples. Show, for example, how a refugee has been given an opportunity at some of the universities and have used that opportunity in the country Europe. We developed the European Qualifications Passport for Refugees, which is intended give a chance to those who left their diplomas behind, cannot document the qualifications, but are qualified. So they found a method of interviewing and assessing those qualifications. If you could find somebody like that, use it, give a name to it, and give an example. And of course, we don't know when reconstruction will start in Ukraine, but we know it will start someday. When it does, we need to be ready. Um, I could well imagine an ARCA's initiative um, and since now you have a cooperation in the Killer um, Academy to help, in this case, the Killer Academy reconstruct, and that's not only physical reconstruction, I'm sure that will be needed, but also demonstrating that European academics believe in the future uh, of Ukraine, of Ukrainian higher education, that some European academics are willing to go there to teach for periods, and hopefully one day also students to exchange not only from, but also to the friends. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, when you asked the question, I started to know the, the ranking of human rights um, in my head, but as you mentioned, I mean, there are so many, and it, it, it just uh, doesn't make sense to make, um, to make a ranking about what is the biggest challenge of human rights violation. And I came then actually also what just said um, within this network like really the protection of the rights to science as well to uh, this this um, to protect scientists and the threat to actually really stand up for them as universities to defend science because science as such became questions a lot we saw it during the pandemic as well um, that there was this understand you know this this um, questioning of scientific results uh, and I think this is one of the major challenges uh, for this network to, to that can be um, addressed and um, when it comes to the academic freedom which is also at the core of the ARCUS network um, I think there will be when we take the case as you mentioned um, of Ukraine um, it is of course and we saw this in other conflict situations like in the former Yugoslavia um, that there is this risk that of brain drain, you know, that the loss of talent, that what we can see in such conflict, post-conflict situations, 
the longer the conflict endures, uh, the higher um, the higher the possibility that people will not go back. So in ACU's activities in this new cooperation, I think this should be a very take a very big part, like really this how to think uh, a kind of a strategic post-war scenario, how to encourage people, how to ensure that Ukraine is not losing its talent. I mean, they're losing the talent on the battlefield, unfortunately. But really, how to ensure that um, the, uh, the Ukrainian higher education system remains competitive attractive to students to actually go back because this is also what we know we need high uh, or highly educated people for a democratic society to ensure that we build a stable sustainable democratic society so in order to avoid this backlash you know just um, just really to make it as a strategic um, vision maybe or, or really to, to have this vision to invest in this reconstruction of the higher education system in its whole. Uh, thank you. Lisa mentioned uh, what I said about the uh, rector's visits in our university and it, it kept going like the, the, the brain drain risk and that uh, that they really worry about uh, the scholars going uh, to other universities and not planning to go back because the reconstruction, as you said, would be in important not for the whole state, for the democracy, but for the future, future of Ukraine. So I think in our strategic thinking, we should um, re remind this um, all the time that we need to support uh, the Ukrainian scholars by having a common research project, uh, teaching projects, our visits, etc., to support them uh, also now in this very difficult moment, but we hope uh, very soon in the reconstru reconstruction um, way. May I just add something? And I think it's also very important to ensure that the voices are heard. You know, this is this, um, it's not only about that other European researchers do research on Ukraine, but that is really uh, this inclusion of Ukrainian researchers, students in the academic debates to provide them the space, to provide them the room, the, the forum for presenting their research, um, whether related to, to the war or not, but just really to make them an integral part of the European scientific landscape. Um, thank you very much. I think we heard a lot of important points uh, about research, teaching, but also the culture of uh, human rights, which should be our everyday practice. Um, I hope you enjoyed the panel as much as I did. And um, if, you, if you want just a final word uh, before we finish, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. Uh, it was really very important for me to listen to, uh, to everything you were saying, and uh, and I reminded one of the one very interesting phrase, which I've read recently. Uh, after we win the war, we should not. Well, sorry. After we win the war, we should not lose the peace. So uh, that would be the main point: not to lose the peace and the peace. It is in terms of human rights, in terms of the rule of law, in terms of democracy. Thank you very much. Well, we have to continue to stand with Ukraine. But I think we more broadly also, you, the example of Ukraine shows the importance of international academic cooperation. We also need to demonstrate how what we're doing from, for Ukraine is important also in the broader complex. Make sure that democracy and human rights count, but also that we demonstrate that international cooperation and higher education count, and that there's a link between the two.
Yeah, and maybe just to stress again this importance for um, universities, university networks as human rights actors. It's already actually in the preamble of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that every human being and every organ of society um, shall strive by teaching and education uh, of human rights to ensure the respect thereof and their effective recognition. So I think this is something um, which should be at the heart of such a um, higher education um, institutions cooperation. Really this um, commitment and this unself commitment and understanding as human universities, as human rights actors. Thank you very much. I would like to thank my excellent panelists. Uh, thank you very uh, much for listening. And I have a dream to moderate a panel in Mohila Academy uh, very soon. <laughs> Thank you very much. we have time for questions. Uh, the organizers told me, so um, please raise on your hand if you have questions. I hope someone would follow with the micro, I guess. The micro is there. So if you have questions, please feel free to use the minutes we have. No questions? I'm really disappointed. Ah, there is one question. Thank you very much. No, no, no. It's, I think this room is too big for that. I give you mine. <laughs> so thank you very much for this very interesting plenary session and for your patience to hear my voice and word. <laughs> um, what would be very interesting to me is your opinion to the role of disinformation. Like I think um, we are now at a moment where we can't really um, say who's really saying the thing. We see person talking about, about uh, um, Ukraine or also other challenges of our society and we don't know if it is real, like referencing to deep fake technology and um, also like uh, disinformation on social media we just uh, don't know who to trust and I think this is a huge threat to democracy and it will be very interesting uh, to hear your opinion too. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean definitely you're raising a, a very important point that actually it's um, disinformation, fake news, how to deal with it and I mean, I think this, the answer is, of course, it, it's very difficult to give an easy answer to a very complex um, issue. Um, but I think we, um, uh, human rights educations would mean, like also not 
not only at the level of university education, but already bring, uh, starting, um, like, you know, at the primary education level, secondary education level, um, bringing human rights education there to um, actually equip students, like pupils, um, with knowledge, but also critical thinking about exactly this, like to teach them to to teach them how to how to deal with this risk of this information i think this is going to be a really big part in human uh, human rights education in the future to build a solid level of knowledge about values about rights about um i mean about the use of technologies, of course, but, but really also in terms about uh, a solid understanding, democracy, awareness for human rights. What are human rights? You know, I, I always found it particularly interesting that in the course of the pandemic, uh, that human rights were very often invoked. It is my right to refuse um, to adhere to corona rules or whatever this understanding of human rights, the limits of human rights, what human rights mean, what human rights are in a society, like as the foundation of a, the, the living together in a society, this will be a very crucial issue. And universities, of course, will have, uh, will have a major role in this, you know, educating the teachers, doing the research, like how to really uh, to understand new technology, how they function, the potential, the threats, the challenges. Um, so it is a multi-layer, I think, approach that we have, a human rights-based approach that we have to develop to these, um, to these um, issues in the future, to really have uh, the next generation a critical, reflective, human rights-aware generation. I mean, it's not a very satisfactory answer, I know, and it's a lot of maybe a, a bit blah, 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 um, but I'm very much aware to, of that, um, but that's, like, right now, that's the best I can give you. But maybe you can no, there, there is obviously no uh, easy answer, and, and Lisa has given a lot of the answer, but I think it also underlines how important it is to make higher education and all education values-based. Um, look, look at your values and say, you know, is, is this piece of information, is that something that looks credible? Is it something that squares with my values? I mean, if President Zelensky says he's doing the, his best to save Ukraine, it's credible. If Putin says he's trying to save Ukraine, it's not credible and don't believe him. Um, you know, the traditional definition of learning outcomes is what you know what you understand and what you're able to do. There's something missing, which is what you're willing to do. And that's the ethical dimension of education. You may be able to do things that you should not do, and history has no shortage of examples of that. Um, that has to be an integral part of what we do as higher education. And if I could, could further that dimension of learning outcomes, uh, I think that would be uh, yet another ARCUS activity that would, or action, uh, that would be important and could leave its mark. It's just a few words. <coughs> so, uh, critical thinking is very important. And, and this is what uh, higher education is about, and not only higher education. So to develop critical thinking. However, the states like the US and other where critical thinking was really a core issue in the education, uh, they are not always uh, successful in this critical thinking. So, God knows. However, what Ukraine uh, really lost before uh, Russia started aggression, we lost uh, information war. And Russia conducted this information war for years and for years. And even after 2014, after Russia annexed Crimea and uh, occupied eastern regions of Ukraine, uh, Nord Stream was almost finished. So I don't know what to do about that. Uh, Russia has huge finances for information campaign. And how to stop it? I think this is what this war is about. To stop Russia's power to do such things. 
and we, we are thankful to Europeans, to a too civilized world, for supporting Ukraine in this battle. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. I know the time is coming. Once again, uh, thank you for, for your participation. Thank you very much for the attention. And now I give you the floor.